Okay. Hello, brothers and sisters. Uh, can you hear me okay now? Uh, unmute myself. There we are. Greetings, brothers and sisters. I'm hopeful to be able to bring a, uh, a short presentation for you as well. Um, but I'll see if I can manage how to do that. I'll just uh, minimize this and try to bring up. Uh, It's a great privilege to be able to join with uh, the people there in the uh, Philippines. Um, now, I've got this up on my screen, but I don't know if uh, it's possible to share that with you. Is it possible to, for me to do that? Yes, we have made you co-host now, Brother Graham, so you can share screen. Share screen. Okay, so that you works. Yourself. You see that now? You see that? Yes. Excellent. All right, so we'll start this now. Okay. There we go. So let's see what happens. Okay, we'll go back here. So I um, hope you can all see that. This is uh, going to talk today about uh, hope. And hope is a big uh, thing in the world at the moment, given that there's so little hope. There's so much tribulation and trials. And I know that in the Philippines, you've had it very hard uh, with COVID. And there's been, uh, of course, there's the war in Europe. Uh, there's all sorts of things happening. And sometimes it can be hard to uh, keep, keep our hope and realise that, uh, that the Lord has everything in hand when so much tribulation comes upon us. Sometimes in life... Uh, it's like a battle, like this boat in the storm. And it's a, a constant battle, trying to battle through the waves and battle through the storm, just trying to get by, trying to uh, just uh, cope as best we can. Other times, life seems to be uh, pretty easy and plain sailing. And suddenly, wham, something comes out of, uh, out of the blue and, and it's a disaster in our lives. So sometimes it could be a sickness, it could be, uh, you know, a financial problem even, or it could be the death of a, a loved one. But these tribulations do come upon us. I'm just going to talk a little bit about a man that had a lot of tribulation come upon him in the Bible, and his uh, name is Job. And I think the story of Job is pretty well known, even by many people in the world. But we read with, uh, in the beginning of the book of Job, chapter 1 and verse 1, there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Now, Job lived uh, well before Jesus Christ's day, a long time in the Old Testament time. And uh, he was a very wealthy man. He had a large family, had extensive uh, property and flocks, and he really loved the Lord. And he uh, had this great love of the Lord. And we know that what happened with Job was that uh, the, the Lord uh, allowed the devil to test Job. And in one day, Job lost all his wealth, uh, all his flocks, everything was lost, and all his children, his 10 children, were di died, they were killed. 
So in one day he lost nearly everything. So this was a great tragedy came upon him all in one day. But we read that what Job's response was in verse 20, he says, Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. So Job uh, did not uh, despair, did not blame God or lose his faith, which is a pretty amazing uh, response for this man. But then it gets, uh, it gets worse for Job, uh, that uh, the, the Lord allowed Satan to take his health away, but not his life. And in Job 2, verse 7, we read, So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he took a potsherd to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. A potsherd is a fragment of pottery. So he was just scraping the uh, boils and sores with this pottery to try to get some relief. So he was obviously in absolute agony. And then we read that he, even his wife uh, despaired and said that uh, there was no hope for him. And we read, then said his wife to him, does thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, thou speaks as one of the foolish women speaks. What, shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. So it's God, Job still did not blame God. And so this was quite an amazing response. Job didn't understand what was going on. And it's not exactly like he, he sort of uh, just saw that it all and understood it. He, he was quite distressed and couldn't understand why all this came upon him. But we do read that in uh, chapter 19, after some friends of his had came and weren't very helpful, he actually made a statement of great faith. And this is one of uh, the great little segments or uh, uh, phrase in the Bible that Job made. And it's his statement of faith. And in Job 19, verse 23, we read, Job says, Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book, that they were graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself. Mine eyes shall behold and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. So in all his despair, Job made this great statement and he was saying that even though so many bad things can happen to him, he's going to be faithful to the Lord and he knows that in the end, he will see the Lord face to face. He'll see his Redeemer and that he's going to be with the Lord. And that's such a great uh, example to all of us in tribulation to keep that faith like Job kept, to not give up and to just persevere and, and keep his belief firm on God, knowing that he was going to be with the Lord in the end. It was a great example. So the word hope, uh, the dictionary definition of hope, if you like, and how it's used in the modern world is a bit different than how it was used in the Bible. Uh, in the modern usage, it's a, a feeling of expectation and a desire for a particular thing to happen. It's sort of we're hoping something might come to pass. It may or it may not. So it's not a sure thing. It's very much just a hope. And we have many things that we hope will happen, and some do and some don't. It's just uh, more what we desire. In the Bible, the biblical word of, of uh, meaning of hope in this context is more a confident expectation it's a firm assurance regarding things not yet seen so it's things that we know are going to happen but haven't yet happened and we read in the book of Romans chapter 8 where Paul is writing to the church at Rome so he's writing to the Christians to brothers and sisters just like us and he says for we are saved by hope but hope that is seen is not hope 
For what a man sees, why does he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then we do, do with patience wait for it. So he's saying we patiently wait for the things that are going to happen, for the return of the Lord, to be with the Lord, and that's what we have hope. And this keeps us in our salvation. And in Hebrews chapter 11, it even links faith and hope as very intertwined, where it says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So I guess faith is hope in action. Uh, so they're both very important things in our walk in the Lord, to keep that faith, to keep that hope, to know that the Lord has all these things in his hand. And then, of course, we get much encouragement in the scripture uh, why, how we can keep this hope and what this great hope is. And once again, uh, Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica, and he, he writes uh, to the brethren, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, those who have died, he means, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep or are died in Jesus will God bring with him for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep or have died for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So Paul's writing about this fantastic hope that we have, that we know the Lord is coming back and that we're going to be with him forever. Those who have passed away already that have died in the Lord and us that remain at the time when he returns will be caught up together with the Lord. And we're going to, in verse 17, it says so shall we ever be with the Lord. This is our great hope that we have. And he actually finishes that verse, that segment off by saying, comfort one another with these words. So we encourage and we uh, exhort and we uplift one another by reminding each other and ourselves, because we need to be encouraged ourselves, that the Lord is coming back for us and that we're going to be with him forever. This is the glorious hope we have. And uh, today we're doing this. We're encouraging one another as we meet together, as we fellowship, as we remember the Lord's death and his, uh, shed his blood for our salvation. We remember all these things. It's a comfort that we're remembering to keep our great hope alive. And again, we read in Hebrews chapter 6 that by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. I think the two immutable things he's saying is that the promises that he'd made, and earlier in this chapter, he's talking about the promises he made to Abraham as well as to us. And the other thing he says, the second the immutable or unchangeable thing is that God can't lie. So he made these promises and God never lies. So we have this strong consolation or comfort because we fled, as it says there, for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. And in verse 19, it says, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters into that within the veil. So the hope we have in the Lord, the knowledge that the Lord's coming back for us is uh, an anchor for our soul. It, it uh, is our a uh, strong point that we hold it's our fortress uh, and because an anchor holds a ship in a storm and even though it's tossed to and fro it holds it safe and that's what our hope is like it holds us safe in the tribulations and trials of this life and it's a it's like our rock that holds us safe at our, our anchor and then it says which enters into that within the veil well, within the veil as the artist's impression at the top is the Holy of Holies in the original temple, the Jewish temple in the old days. The Holy of Holies is where God met with the, the high priest. It was a, the very presence of God. And so it's saying that we have this anchor for our soul 
and we can enter into the very presence of God. This is an amazing hope to have, and it gives us such comfort and such reassurance to know that God has us in his hands, no matter what problems come upon us, no matter what the trials and tribulations of this life, we have this hope as an anchor for our soul and uh, so that we can be in the presence of God. And the end result of this uh, great hope that we have is that, uh, as it writes in near the end of Revelation, the vision that John had of the end times, and he, uh, he records here in Revelation 21, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle or dwelling place of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Now, it's really hard for John to describe, I guess, what he saw when he saw the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. But he writes how wonderful it's going to be that God will be with us and be with us all the time. He'll even wipe away any tears from our eyes. There will be no more sorrow or crying, no pain. And, of course, the final uh, enemy to be defeated is death, the Bible says, and, and that's going to be taken away as well. I've drawn that little red arrow because I reserved that place for me when we get to heaven. Because <laughs> that one there, it looks like a great spot with a great view. So you'll have to choose another one. But wherever it is, it's going to be wonderful for all of us. So I guess how do we get this hope? What is this hope based on? What is this hope and faith we have? Well, it's recorded pretty clearly for us in the Bible in many places. And one of the uh, classic places is, in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, when about 120 disciples received the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues and it caused a great stir in the city and people didn't know what was happening. And uh, Peter preached to the people and said that this is the promise of God. And he quoted the Old Testament in Joel and Psalms and was saying that the promise of God to come and dwell within people, that's what there was with receiving the Holy Spirit that they heard. And he told them also that they'd crucified the Son of God. And uh, basically, they got very uh, disturbed, I guess, when they heard this and convicted. And it says in uh, verse 37 of Acts 2, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? So these people had made a terrible mistake by crucifying the Son of God. It was all God's plan, of course, for our salvation. But, of course, it was still a horrible thing that they were party to. And, of course, we were all guilty of that. We all were consenting to Jesus' death because it was our sin that made him be crucified. So we were just as guilty as them because of the fact that we'd all sinned and come short of the glory of God, uh, that Jesus had to die for us. And uh, the response that Peter said, he told them very clearly what they had to do. When they said, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises to you and to your children, to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So Peter makes it quite clear that not just for those people listening to him, but to, for those that are coming after them, the children, their future generations, and to others that are afar off and living elsewhere, that the Lord our God's calling people to be baptised, to repent of their sins, to receive the Holy Spirit, just as the apostles had done on the day of Pentecost when they received the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 19. I'll just quote this as an example because I, as we read in the scriptures, there's many examples of people doing just this, just what Peter commanded and what the Lord had commanded, people that were baptised and received the Spirit. 
as Jesus described it, being born again of water and the spirit. One such example is in Acts chapter 19, when Paul was going through an area in Ephesus, a different area, not in, not in Israel, and he was in Ephesus, and, and it read there that uh, in Acts 19 verse 4, and Paul's talking to these men, about 12 of them, and he said, John, verily or truly baptised with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him which should come after, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with God and prophesied. And the word prophesied means that they're saying the wonderful things of the Lord and speaking forth the great blessings of God. So it was just as it happened to the disciples on the first day of Pentecost. And it also happened to these people in Acts 19. There's other examples in Acts chapter 10 and elsewhere of people that were obedient to God's promise and they were baptized, received the Holy Spirit speaking with tongues. And there's many testimonies, of course, that we have today of the same thing happened. God hasn't changed. The message is the same. The promises are the same. And our hope is the same. We obey God's word. We're obedient to his uh, commandments. And we have this great hope. And because we have this great hope, we can say together with Job, as Job said, we can say, for I know that my Redeemer lives and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I, shall I see God. And we can claim the same promise of Job that uh, we're going to see the Lord. No matter what happens to us in this life and what things can come upon us, we know that the Lord lives, that Jesus Christ is our Redeemer, that he lives. We know that he's coming back to stand on the latter day upon the earth. And we know that we're going to see God and that we'll dwell with him forever. And all the people said, amen. amen. I'll leave it there. Um, if you can take it back from me somehow, Joshua. <laughs>